Cool. All right. Thank you for joining the review today. Uh, we're going to talk about fire testing uh, with three specific tools, ONC Inferno, MITRE Crucible, and Aegis Touchdown. Um, have any of you heard of these tools before? Just curious. I'll take silence as a no. All right. So uh, we're going to learn a few things today. Um, before jumping into the tools themselves, I'm going to give a uh, a brief history, uh, such that history starts in 1996 with HIPAA, uh, of the law and the regulatory landscape that um, resulted in these testing tools. Um, then we're going to walk through an example of what manual testing would look like. Um, and then we're going to jump into ONC Inferno, followed by the other two. So it's important to recognize that when we talk about fire and we talk about fire testing, um, it does not exist in a vacuum. Um, so this is a brief timeline of the laws that take us up to today. Um, you've all gone through HIPAA training, so you know what that is. Um, there is a lag time between when a law uh, comes out to when it's actually implemented. So Congress will pass a law, say in 1996, there will be two to three to four, maybe even five years of rulemaking uh, so you see the HIPAA security rule was not published until 2003. Um, then after the rule is published, there is a, a multi-year period for enforcement, normally a year enforcement delay, and then a graduated, uh, graduated schedule that comes out after that. We talk a lot about ONC, uh, the Office of the National Coordinator. So I just wanted to show how ONC fits into the timeline of HIPAA and these other acts that you might have heard of. Um, so HIPAA makes no mention of ONC. It did not exist at the time. Uh, ONC, uh, the Office of the National Coordinator for Health IT, was created uh, by an executive order in 2004. Um, it was then um, kind of made in statute uh, that is made in law in 2009 with the High Tech Act. Um, and one of the things that uh, the ONC does is um, take a law like the High Tech Act or like the 21st Century Cures Act and translate that raw law into concrete rules. So, for example, the High Tech Act applied uh, a very large amount of money to subsidize EHRs. I think uh, HHS was delegated something like $25 billion to subsidize EHRs. ONC then had to define, okay, what does it mean to be an EHR? What does it mean to be a certified EHR? They came out with a rule in 2012 called 2014 edition rule, which was then revised in 2015 with 2015 edition rule. A very similar process is happening with cures. So in the Cures Act, uh, Congress says we want, uh, we, we want to expand the HIPAA right of access to explicitly include APIs. So now ONC is tasked with, okay, we have this mandate from Congress, which is given in the Cures Act. We need to translate that into a rule. ONC put out a proposed rule in 2019. And the final rule was published in May, 2020, uh, on May Day, actually, International Workers' Day. So in the same way that there is a lag between Congress acting in the High Tech Act and then that eventually getting through to certified EHR criteria, there's also a lag time in Congress saying, okay, use APIs now and there being a rule um, that ONC can publish. And just for context, um, at the top, you see kind of the timeline of ONC, and on the bottom, you see the history of the standards because the policy and the, uh, and the, the rulemaking and the standards kind of all go in, in sync. So when the 21st Century Cures Act was published and ONC was looking at um, standards that they could use, at that time, you're, you're talking about fire DST2 and you're talking about the Argonaut project. Um, so the, the more modern fire standards that we're used to working with, STU3 and R4, did not exist at the time. And neither did um, ways of doing like authorization control, which is outside the scope of fire. And we'll talk about that a bit later. Questions? Nope. Okay, so to recap, um, this is my opinionated history of the ONC Cures Rule. Um, in 1996, Congress says individuals have a HIPAA right of access. 
um, at the time that HIPAA right of access was was kind of understood to be written access. And to put that in perspective, um, REST wasn't formalized until, until 2000. Um, the HTTPS standard wasn't formalized until 2000 either. High tech then goes on to say, all right, um, right of access. When HIPAA was written, that meant written, but now we're gonna allow electronic access. And because EHR adoption was actually pretty low um, in the it, at that time, you know, 2008, 2009, um, they had a big subsidy for EHRs. And over the past 10 years, you've seen EHR adoption in hospitals go from something like, you know, 10% to almost every hospital using EHR, 99%. And in small group practices, you've seen EHR adoption, individual physician practices, you've seen EHR adoption go from, you know, two or 3% in 2009 to 90%. Now, we come forward to 2015 with the rulemaking. So the 2015 edition requires a CCD export of, of uh, uh, the CCDS, the uh, common clinical data set. So that means that if a hospital uses a certified EHR, which at this point they almost certainly do, um, a patient must be able to get access to their records. They must be able to get access in, uh, the, the EHR must be able to export a CCDA format. And then the HIPAA right of access also says things like a patient has the ability to delegate access to a caregiver. And a patient also has a right to uh, delegate access to a third party group or application. But the problem is the EHR just the, requ the EHR requirement is to export a CCDA. A patient can't really do much with just a straight CCDA. So there's a gap between the HIPAA right of access and a patient being able to meaningfully delegate their access and the certification required criteria, which says that the HR must be able to export CCA. So in 2016, Congress says, this is very important, it's the most important language of the entire act. Congress says, without special effort through the use of application programming interfaces. So now we're going from a CCD export from, a, from, a, from an EHR to without special effort through an API. And through the ONC rule, ONC will interpret this to say, all right, yes, an API, but we've seen problems with API adoption before. Because if you just say an API, Epic and Cerner and all scripts are gonna come up with their own proprietary API, and you're not going to have a meaningful right of access because every company is gonna have its own little walled garden that you're gonna have to pay to play in. So ONC very smartly said, okay, API without special effort means use fire. And they designed a ratchet mechanism, uh, a version advancement process within the US CDI that says, um, and we're going to um, allow companies to voluntarily increase the fire version and the fire standard that they use in the future. So the rule maker, Ooh. yeah, exactly, right? All right. Um, so with respect to the, the rulemaking, um, 2016, the law came out, 2000, the rule, that's a four year lag. There's a three year timeline on the actual rule implementation and rollout for ONC. Um, you've probably also heard of the CMS regulation. Um, so the, the, the Cures Act was very expansive. ONC has one part of it, specifically around the API definition but um, CMS has a part as well with Medicaid and Medicare. So if you've heard about like the patient access right or individual access right and payer to payer access, that's all in the CMS rule. Um, the, the Cures Act also sponsored rules or, or promulgated rulemaking from Office of the Inspector General for enforcement, um, Office of Civil Rights for enforcement as well. So you can say Cures, now we get to a specific rule that's talking about APIs and we have a three year rollout for for the rules. So within the rule, ONC says use fire. And ONC says that the data elements that must be exchanged via fire are the US core data for interoperability, which is going to um, secede the common clinical data set. So you have fire, 
you're using the US core implementation guide for fire, which codifies the US core data for interoperability. And that allows you to access resources like, uh, you know, patient. So in the US, we have a particular way of encoding gender and race, et cetera, for a patient. That's all encoded in US core, and it comes out of the US CDI requirements. But fire says nothing about access and delegating access. So if I'm an individual and I want to say, hey, third party application, you can use a limited subset of my data. Uh, the fire spec as such, US core, um, doesn't say anything about that. That's where smart comes in. So the 21st century uh, Cures Act rule for ONC is saying use fire, use the US core implementation guide for fire, and use smart on fire to define the access control. So what does this look like? I'm going to stop sharing my screen and share a web page from ONC. Share my entire screen, sure. All right. So there is a, there's a cures rule. The rule is very long. Within the cures rule, there's a section on uh, standardization for APIs. It's called G10. It's the most important section for uh, us as API developers. Not that the other sections aren't important, but G10 is the one that's going to come up the most often. Now, from cures, you get, right, you get, um, you know, use an API. From ONC rule, you get use fire. Within GT, you get the exact standards that a fire API must take. You get a test plan, uh, which is the system under test and all the things it must do. And you have the test lab verification. And this is, is used for certification. So ONC, instead of developing a whole new set of rulemaking and a whole new process, they said, all right, we already have 2015 edition um, EHR certification criteria. So we're going to extend the 2015 EHR certification criteria with sort of this, this cures amendment that's going to include things like API access. And on top of that, we're going to give you, we're going to say, um, you know, use existing industry standards, fire and smart on fire. And we're going to give you the exact test plan of what is going to be tested. So if you want to see what this looks like, um, what a, an individual that is developing a fire server would have to do is go through this test plan, make sure it all works, and then uh, pay an ONC um, testing laboratory to go through and say it's certified. I'm going to take a really simple example, um, six. Um, this is dealing with uh, discovery. So Smart on Fire is using OAuth. OAuth needs to do um, token authorization, uh, and it needs to be able to grant tokens. So the fire, the, the fire server needs to say what endpoints are. So I can manually go, and I can take uh, Happy Fire, for example. I can take the base URL of Happy Fire. I can say, all right. I want to use this well-known smart configuration, and Happy Fire should support that. Oh, Happy Fire does not support that. So let's use a fire server that does. well-known endpoint. This is an Inferno fire server. All right, and here's your well-known endpoint. And your well-known endpoint has the authorization endpoint and the token endpoint. So you can go back to the criteria and you can check this box for six because it supports the endpoints. Um, you can see that this is a very, very long list and it's very, very detailed. So historically, uh, you've had individuals, um, engineers and tests that actually go through and do a manual test verification and then hand it off to 
a testing lab to also do a verification. But ONC said that uh, do, 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 do. But ONC said, okay, going through and doing this manual test plan is, is, is a lot of work. So how about we develop a software tool, Inferno, um, that will allow developers to very easily do uh, sort of semi-automated testing against the G10 and other criteria. And this has two impacts. One, uh, if you are um, going for fire certification, you can pretest with something like Inferno so that you know you'll pass certification. And if you're not going through the, reg the regulatory rigmarole of cert certification, uh, you can use the test to make sure that you're conformant without being like technically certified, but you still know it works. So this is Inferno. Uh, it's hosted online and it's open source. They have two editions, the ONC program edition and the community edition. Uh, I'm going to walk through the ONC program edition since it's tied directly to the regulation. Um, the community edition is uh, sort of thinking about how can you use a testing suite like Inferno to be more expansive. So if we go into the ONC program edition, um, this will test only against Fire R4, the US core implementation guide, which is built on R4, uh, and the Smart on Fire launch configuration. Real quick, Ryan, um, you're not sharing anymore. Oh, excuse me. Uh, when, when did the sharing cut out? Um, right as you started talking about community edition. All right. Uh, thank you, Grant. Can you see me now? Yes. Cool. All right, so ONC program edition, ONC community edition. The ONC program edition is only going to test the things that are specified within G10 and those other ONC criteria. So for example, if there's another implementation guide, say an implementation guide that we use pretty frequently, like the Blue Button 2.0 implementation guide, or the Karen uh, Common uh, Pair Consumer Dataset implementation guide, um, that is outside the scope of Inferno. Program edition. However, uh, an enterprising developer could uh, expand the Inferno Community Edition to support testing those other implementation guides. So we're going to test against a public sandbox, which is this Inferno sandbox. This is the same exact sandbox um, that I tested this well-known endpoint against. And Inferno gives you a step-by-step -step testing process. So each one of these, um, these yellow arrows, the standalone app, the limited app, the EHR practitioner app, um, is Inferno specifies as a sequence. So I can start off the sequence, smart on fire discovery. I can look at the state of the application. And before you've done application discovery, you know absolutely nothing about the application. You don't know the auth server endpoints. Um, you don't know client credential, client secrets, you, you, you know nothing. Now, we're going to run the first test. And Inferno is going to step through the, um, basically the, the login process. So, you know, I skipped the consent screen, but I would have to log in. Uh, I have to pick which patient I want to be. I'm going to be patient 76. I have to pick the scopes that I'm going to allow uh, Inferno, which is a client application to use against the server. So if you recall from um, James's talk or from Mike's talk, um, we were talking about the, the Smart on Fire authorization scopes. Here they are used in a, a testing context. So if I don't give access to medication, then the fire server will not be able to read anything about medications, but they will be able to read things about the patient. I'm going to authorize the application, and then the tests are going to run. And the exact same test that I did manually is right here. This is looking at the well-known endpoint for the smart on fire configuration. And the test as they exist here 
are uh, laid out identically to the ONC testing plan. So if you can pass an ONC Inferno test, you have a pretty high confidence um, that your application is conformant. And when we click the state, we can see that the state has been um, populated from the self-discovery. Um, as an aside, in terms of self-discovery endpoints, the two most important are going to be this well-known endpoint, which tells you about the smart on fire configuration, um, and then the metadata endpoint, which contains the conformance, which contains the conformance statement, or capability statement. So using these two pieces, um, you can, from knowing nothing about an application server, except that it's, except that, you know, it supports the well-known endpoint, i.e. Smart on Fire, and it supports this metadata endpoint, which specifies the implementation guides and fire versions, et cetera, you should be able to use the application. And in doing so, um, ONC is hoping to realize the, the promise of without special effort. Because you don't have to go around and learn Epic's particular way of doing things, Cerner's, all scripts, et cetera's particular way of doing things. Um, and that's that's sort of the power of um, of of this standard driven testing, and it's the power of Inferno. Why why is the endpoint named like dot well known? What is what is that naming convention about? Uh, so that the, the dot well known naming convention comes from uh, OAuth. Oh, got it. Okay. So um, uh, that so you'll also use dot well known for your key file. So if you remember from James's presentation. Um, he had a section about, all right, we need, to, we need to validate the signatures of access tokens. And to do that, we need to look up well-known uh, jkws.json, which has all the key IDs and the, and the, and the public keys. Same exact um, high-level endpoint. So Smart on Fire extends this to say, all right, well, we're going to use well-known for the Smart on Fire configuration to tell you how to use it. In the same way that you use well-known to list the, the, the key IDs and the, and, the, and the signings for the key IDs so that you can... Um, verify the signing of an access token. Got it. Other questions? Um, likewise, you, well, I'm skipping ahead a little bit. Um, after you've done the discovery, uh, you can run tests about the conformance to the things that must be supported. So, I mentioned US CDI previously. The US, core, uh, the US CDI defines the, the things about a patient and about medication statements, about physician notes that must be defined. And you test it here. So you can run the test. I'm only, yeah, let's test for both of these. The test run. Um, and then you'll be able to see that this API is conformant against US core, which means that it's conformant against US CDI, which means that uh, it passes the G10 criteria in the, in the regulation. Ah. Cool. All right, so now I'm gonna take an aside into, a f into uh, and sorry, and you can see all the various tests that are being run, like you know, patient ID can you know pull these things, and you can introspect all the way down to the exact bundle that was being returned, which is very powerful. So now I'm going to dive into the code base just a little bit because I think it's important to see how they organize their testing. Uh, Inferno is open source which means we can just go on GitHub and look at the code and see how it works. Download Inferno, which takes us to GitHub. And we're gonna to navigate to where the tests are actually being run. Um, this is a Ruby application um, using Bundle, if you're uh, Ruby folks. So at the very top level, you have modules. That's the highest level of organization. So you have a program module, and it has a specification that's going to define the test procedures, the test sets, and individual sequences that you can run within it. Each of these sequences 
is defined in its own file. And each sequence is defined as its own class, which is actually very powerful. So if I go into the ONC program um, and I pull up this smart discovery sequence, this is the exact test that was run. And this entire sequence itself is inheriting from sequence base, which means that if I want to use um, sort of uh, the, the smart discovery sequence in another test plan and another server that might use the smart on fire, but not be within the constraints of exactly this ONC program edition, I can reuse the ONC smart discovery and not have to rewrite it. And I can use these sequences as building blocks um, to test against other implementation guides. So I thought that was a very powerful way of, of organizing. Um, one downside of the Inferno approach, well, upside downside is that they're using Ruby to write their test. Um, this allows you to have a lot of power in that anything that, that you can use in Ruby, uh, you can use to do your testing against. Um, but it means that there's going to be a gap or could be a gap between the implementation guide as written you know, so-and-so shall do X, so-and-so shall do Y, and the test as they're written in Ruby. Um, you, have to, you have to read the implementation guide and write Ruby test for it. It also means that the tests exist outside of Fire. Um, there is a Fire resource called Test Script and also Test Response, which allows you to define testing in a, in a Fire way, and Inferno does not use it. Uh, we'll talk about a tool that does use it a little bit later. Um, the other thing that's um, sort of something to note about Inferno is that it's designed to test uh, conformance against G10, which means that there's no tracking of conformance over time. And there's also no like pretty summary diagrams uh, where you can see uh, sort of the, the conformance status of an entire server. You know, you implement 86% of R4 that doesn't exist within Inferno. All right. Questions about Inferno? If somebody pinged me, could you say it out loud? Tyler just said, sounds good so far. Cool. All right. Y'all can still see my screen? Yes. Beautiful. All right. So Inferno does not exist in a, in a vacuum. Um, there's, a, there's a short, long history of fire testing tools that came before Inferno. Um, ONC designed a tool that just looked at conformance testing that's available on their website where, you, where you're hard coding your test in JavaScript. It doesn't have this sort of hierarchical organization like Inferno does, discontinued. Uh, Sync for Science, which was another group, wrote a test suite in Python discontinued and they gave you the specific subset of Inferno tests that you need to use to conform to them. Um, MITRE Crucible was written by the same team that wrote ONC Inferno. Uh, unfortunately, I hope somebody picks up um, maintenance for it because it's a cool tool, um, but it has not been sort of actively maintained in about a year. And we're gonna briefly step through Crucible so you can see some of the differences between this very um, like, conformance for certification-based testing that Inferno does and a more uh, general testing style that Crucible takes. So this is Crucible. What Crucible allows you to do uh, is uh, sort of display a public leaderboard of fire servers. So you can go in and test a fire server over time and see the history of how the conformance of that fire server evolved. Um, this is very, very powerful as you're building out functionality and it's something that Inferno doesn't give you. Like Inferno, uh, you can do your test against um, sort of your individual uh, fire resources. So you can go into like a, let me pick a, let me pick, patient all the time. We, we can pick just the patient resource and we can see the tests that are under the patient resource. 
and we can run just those tests. And the test for patient will be logged and put into the test history for the, for the application. So Crucible and Inferno, there, there was a question on one of the, um, uh, on the fire chat about, all right, so what is the difference between Crucible and Inferno? Um, and the short answer is they're both open source. Um, they both rely on Ruby testing, but Inferno is targeted after, uh, or at least the Inferno program edition is targeted after conformance to a regulation. Crucible is uh, just a generic testing suite that allows you to look at your, your test over time and also to visualize different servers. Um, another, I guess, disadvantage of Crucible is in the way the tests are laid out. Um, so in Inferno, you have this very nice module sequence definition. Uh, if you look at the Crucible code base, you don't have this nice, um, this nice hierarchy, which means that when you are writing a test, let's say a specific test about, I think, X X70 is the deletion. That test exists in isolation. Um, it's not a part of, a, of an encapsulating class. It's not put into a module. It's just that's what the test is. So if you wanted to reuse this, you're looking at copy pasta or having to reorganize Crucible itself. Um, so it's really nice to see that the MITRE team has learned about like test organization from going through the process with Crucible. Um, and I really hope that um, you know, Crucible uh, maintains itself as a project because it's it's the only like open source. Let's look at a leaderboard of fire servers and see how well they can form. That's out there. And I know this seems silly, but I really like this diagram. I mean, in terms of like visual representation, you can look at two fire servers side by side with this diagram and see, um, you know, what does you know, which fire server does what. Okay, so going back to the brief history of testing tools, um, there's another company, Aegis Touchstone, um, which took a different approach than the MITRE team with uh, Crucible and Inferno. Instead of writing their test in Ruby, um, the Aegis Touchstone team decided to use the Fire Test Script language. Um, so within Fire, if you look in their resources, there's this test script. It has a moderate level of maturity. Um, and you basically define um, fixtures for your data, um, the tests, the action, and the assertions off of the action, all within Fire. And Touchstone has authored an implementation guide to teach you how to use this test script. So if we come back and look at Inferno, we have sort of a, a list of tests that are encoded in Ruby, in Crucible, we have a list of tests also encoded in Ruby. We go over to Touchstone, their interface is a little bit different. Um, first up, they're a, a software as a service solution. Um, it's closed source. But based on these fire test scripts, they have an expansive library. So every fire release going back to the initial Argonaut specification pre-1, all of the connectathons, which are sort of fire hackathons that happen three times a year, have test scripts written in Touchstone. So you can navigate through and you can say, all right, I'm going to look at um, fire R4. All the resource types are specified. I'm going to look at patient. I'm going to look at patients with a server assigned ID. And I'm going to look at the test script. And there it is. Um, your mileage may vary on whether this is more readable to you than the Ruby, but it holds the promise of being able to reuse the test script and other test applications. So that in theory, if you write uh, you know, a test with assertions in this test script language, you should be able to go to any other uh, testing tool or conformance tool 
that uses the Fire Test Script language and use it. Unfortunately, um, this Aegis Touchstone is the only piece of software that I've been able to find that uses Test Script. Uh, within Aegis, you have a list of test systems where you can create a new test system. Um, since Aegis is software as a service only, you cannot actually test against things locally. Like you can't enter a local host address here, it'll fail. Um, after you've created a test system, you can create a test setup. So you go in from this expansive library of tests, you, you pick individual test script files, you select which test script files you want to use, you create a test setup, and then you can execute that test setup. In this case, I'm executing the test setup against um, uh, just a, a wildfire reference server. Those tests will run. And then in the same way that Inferno and Crucible allowed you to do the introspection, uh, you can also do the introspection from within um, Touchstone. So all the request details are there, exactly what happens there, and you can cross-reference um, from the test script assertions through to what it's actually checking for within the objects that came back from the fire server. So to kind of restart Touchstone is closed source. Uh, it's the only tool that I've been able to find that allows you to test with fire test scripts. Um, and I mean, if, if you've looked at one of these test scripts, I'm just going to pull up an arbitrary one. Um, it's a lot. Um, there's no way that somebody is actually going to author one of these test scripts, uh, just writing it out in them. Uh, so Touchstone has provided an, an IDE and Eclipse that allows you to author test scripts. But if you do so, to the best of my knowledge, the only place that you can actually run them is Touchstone, and Touchstone is closed source pay to play. Questions? Ryan, I have one, but this is not as much from the code standpoint as much as it's, it is from the strategic standpoint. What's mm -hmm. the motivation, do you think, for Touchstone to uh, to basically work on this and enable this platform so we can test the fire script? Um, I mean, they've developed a niche. So if you look at the uh, Touchstone list of organizations, uh, it's a who's who of who's involved in fire. So because, to the best of my knowledge, they're the only, they're the, 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 this, this, this is the most mature um, testing environment that exists. They're used at every connectathon. And because they're the most mature fire test environment that exists, every company that's involved in fire, Blue Cross, Blue Shield, uh, Firely, um, et cetera, are, you know, have accounts here. Um, how many are paying? I don't know. Um, but if you want very robust fire testing, um, it's kind of the only game in town from what I've seen of Inferno and Crucible and looking at some of those other tools that I gave a brief history of here. Got it. And you think the same rationale for Crucible because it's by MITRE, right? So, um, and Crucible is open source, correct? Correct. So, um, I don't, I don't know exactly how the funding worked, um, but I know that ONC has a contract with MITRE. Yeah, my great grand or something. Yeah. Cool. And, and I, I, was, mm -hmm. I was curious from BD's standpoint. I, I didn't catch you. I was just saying, I was just curious from BD's standpoint of how the model works and try to see if we can emulate or get some ideas, but that was just the context behind where it was coming from. Gotcha. So I don't know exactly how uh, like profitable Touchstone is. Um, I know that they have, you know, kind of tiered pricing that starts at a thousand dollars a year with a few different tiers. Um, but I don't know how much revenue they generate off of the system. Um, 
from my perspective, obviously it would have been much better if it was open source. Um, but I mean, they, they've identified a niche. Um, mm -hmm. And speaking of niches, when, when you start looking at like testing and all these rules, um, there is a lot of space for companies to <laughs> frankly insert themselves and make money. Um, so if you look at like the authorized testing labs, ONC has five authorized testing labs and not all five of those labs will do uh, all of the different types of tests since you have to get your testing done on each different um, thing. So for example, if you go back here, there's a, there's, there's, there's a separate test for each one of the regulation sections. Um, so for example, um, uh, NCQA will do the certification testing for 2015 against data quality stuff, but not anything else. And some of the other ones like Drummond and UL um, may or may not do data quality. So in that vein, Touchstone is another sort of niche tool that if you're going to seriously author implementation guides, you need a way to test them. And if you want to seriously test, um, as far as I can see, your only option is Touchstone. Got it. Other questions? Yeah, quick, mm -hmm. interesting or theoretical question. How hard would it be to write an open source test script runner to compete with Touchdown? Hard <laughs> uh, is, is the short answer. Um, so if we if we if we think about the components, um, there's this GUI which you could do in like um, you know a Rails application or a Node application, um, but then you actually have to write or reuse all the test definitions. Then you have to implement the implementation guide to test all of the various things that happen in one of these test plans. Because since you're not writing, excuse me, since you're not writing in a, in a programming language, uh, everything must be defined by an XML tag. So operation outcomes, which you're allowed to do, uh, expected responses must all be defined. So you're looking at just a lot of, I don't know what their source code looks like, um, but you're looking at a lot of XML parsing, uh, a lot of edge case handling. Um, it's, it's, it, it's not, it would not be trivial to replicate um, Touchstone. Um, Ryan, from what you explained, it sounds like it's more time consuming than complex. Is that right? Oh, uh, yeah, I can. I, yeah, I can accept that. Got it. Because from complexity standpoint, right, you're looking at a GUI, you're really looking at the test scripts that's already been there that you might be able to reuse, repurpose, and then the implementation guides and XML parsing, right, like the basic components. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so from complexity standpoint, it sounds like something like, you know, we could do, but from time standpoint, I think that's where the trick is. And this is this is this is one of the This, this is a sticking point of, of, of everything related to fire. Um, the spirit of the law says without special effort. But the law is being written with, um, I would say undue influence from a bunch of commercial companies. And each of those companies wants to define its niche and stake out its turf so it can make money. You get this from the testing providers, um, you get this from the tool makers, uh, you get this from the HR vendors at the concern of themselves and creating walled gardens. Um, so here you, you can kind of see that choice. You can use the open source tools, uh, which have been developed um, by MITRE on a contract from ONC, and you can see the limitations of those tools versus something like Techstone, which is closed source and is trying to defend a niche for fire testing. And you see this with the implementation guides as well. So Karen is an industry alliance. So they are defining, Blue Cross, Blue Shield, and the rest of them are defining um, what it means to exchange uh, consumer-directed payer information with FHIR. And then ONC is going to adopt it, um, most likely in a subsequent regulation that's going to happen a few years from now. Um, 
make sense? So, I mean, that that's it. Um, I, I guess if I had like a, um, like, like a high level recap for developers and thinking about fire testing, um, it's that as a developer, um, we're under constant pressure to undermine the HIPAA right of access. Um, and this is done for commercial reasons. Um, so when you're talking to a company that, you know, might be um, making software so that um, state Medicaid agencies can uh, obey not, not the ONC rule, but the CMS rule, which builds on the ONC rule, um, when when they make design decisions like the rule itself the cms rule proper doesn't say that the api access needs to allow delegated access for authorized representatives even though the hipaa right of access says that you should be able to delegate access to, to authorized representatives um so we're not going to implement it because the rule doesn't say it that's a chip against the spirit of the right of access and as a developer um if if you if you if you look a little bit you're going to see a lot of these chips happening and that's kind of just that's kind of just the way things are um, with respect to the spirit of the law versus the way the law is encoded versus all of the loopholes that commercial entities will find to find their niche so that they can that they can make money or, or, or minimize the expense that you know a CMS agency might that a state Medicaid agency might see as like just the regulatory burden um, the other takeaway is that um, sort of the scope of the law and therefore what's encoded in the regulations and therefore what rolls down to the testing requirements does not happen in a vacuum. So when we talk about HIPAA and we talk about the right of access, um, there were commercial interests in play in 1996 as there are now that made that very explicitly in the law a right of access and not a right of ownership. You don't own your health data. You have access to it. Um, and the Cures Act is expanding what it means to have access to it. So hopefully in the future, uh, people, us, uh, Medicaid members, anybody that, that has their health information stored in the EHR uh, can realize that, that right of access in a meaningful way without special effort. Cool. Thanks so much, Brian. Yeah. Any other final questions? <laughs>